thank you so much, Dr. Bazin. Okay, so the next question we have is that you have been a translator and you still are a translator. What makes a good translator? Uh, if you're speaking about, there are two types. I mean, one is an interpreter that's doing a live translation, and the other is a translator of texts. And you've done both. And I've done both. For being an interpreter, uh, what, uh, first of all, as uh, my wonderful teacher, the uh, former, you know, the late, how do we say that? Uh, previous the previous Sirkin Rinpoche, <laughs> thank you. The, uh, as my, uh, 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 the, the teacher that I translated the most for, which was uh, the previous Sirkin Rinpoche, he gave very good advice that the uh, interpreter should be invisible. You are not there to uh, demonstrate your personality or your opinion or anything like that. You shouldn't move your hands around like a dancer. You should uh, always have uh, your hands down, be very humble, and just be the voice of uh, the uh, person. If the person is using rough language, use rough language. If they're using very gentle language, use gentle language. Just, you know, completely uh, uh, be the medium for what they were saying. You don't say, Rinpoche said this, or, you know, His Holiness said this. If they say, I say this, you say, I say this. So, uh, like that. And he said, don't add anything and don't leave anything out. So this is uh, very challenging, of course, when the uh, teacher uh, speaks for a very long time. This is very, very difficult. Uh, you have to remember, and the only way to be able to remember things like lists and so on is that you have to know them already. You can't possibly uh, memorize them, you know, from a teacher rattling off at super speed uh, a list of things. Uh, best is if you have a very close relationship uh, with the teacher so that uh, you have uh, uh, harmony with them, you know how they speak, you're familiar with their dialect, uh, this sort of thing, and uh, just be very humble and also be willing to be corrected. You know, very often I've been corrected, let's say, uh, translating for His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and there are 10,000 people there, and His Holiness says, ha, 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 he just made a mistake. And you have to be able to just go on without uh, losing your composure or anything like that. So uh, it requires a great deal of personal development as well to be able to do a, be a good interpreter. Now, uh, there also is, uh, it's important to have uh, good terminology and to be familiar with what terminology you're going to use. And uh, don't stick necessarily with the terms. I mean, this is what I've uh, always done. Try to find words in your own language that actually mean what uh, the uh, words in Tibetan or whatever language it is that you're translating from, what they actually mean. And don't just uh, use words that, uh, let's say, the missionaries chose uh, 150 years ago uh, for translating the Bible, which uh, might not be at all relevant or might be quite misleading in terms of uh, the Buddhist uh, translations. This is the same thing for translating texts, that uh, we try to make it uh, readable. This is also uh, very important. Uh, so it requires not just uh, being accurate in the uh, translation, but uh, being faithful to the translation, which means uh, paying attention to the grammar. Uh, very often people don't pay attention to the, you know, when it's in the past tense or the present tense, or especially Sanskrit is so rich in uh, grammatical constructions that uh, it's important to uh, express it the way that the author expressed it. And when you change around like, for instance, I've noticed very often that uh, when there are lists or things like that, the order in which things are listed is relevant. And sometimes translators will change the order around and they lose that. So it's important to be faithful to the text, but uh, make sure that it is readable.